happened is basically exactly what needed to happen. We just kept going. We just kept writing. We kept writing songs. I mean, that was a really dark, dark period for, for, this, for this band because we didn't really know what the future was going to be at all. And then I think the powers that be kind of looked down at us and be like, these guys had this, have had some shitty luck since fucking, since Stomp. And let's go easy on them. We got a call. Metallica's going to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and they would like you and Scott to attend. That to me is, is, was like one of the greatest things that I've heard. I was like, of course. After the whole uh, ceremony, Talca had a, a party at the Hard Rock. And I remember Scott and I were at the bar with Lars and just talking and then Lars hit, hits us with, uh, what do you guys think about doing Big Four? And we looked at each other like, huh, what? All four bands, Metallica, Slayer, Anthrax, playing on one stage, of course, Metallica headlining. We talked a little more about it, and then Lars went and uh, talked to someone else, and then Scott and I looked at, looked at each other, and I said, we gotta get our shit together. That's what really lit a fire under everybody's asses to, to get our shit together, you know? Getting to do those big four shows would be a real boost for us, to be on that, share, share that stage with our friends and those bands and be in front of those audiences. The idea of the big four and doing shows with the other three bands that, you know, the, the four bands that all came up together that we talked so much about weeks ago on this docu-series back in the early days of Fistful of Metal and spreading and, you know, all of us becoming fast friends in those years, you know, 83, 84, 85, all four bands now have having had careers decades you know of touring together and uh the success we've all had and just uh, you know it really got us thinking that we'd be crazy not to ask joey to be a part of this because it really was that was the band from that era that was the band that put anthrax on the map and now we're getting asked to essentially go out and do shows where it would be putting us back on the map again. It didn't make any sense to have anyone else but Joey Belladonna. That was the catalyst that I think we want to bring back that sound, that band that was part of the big four. And a lot of that had to do with us and Joey. When he came back and they did those shows, it was undeniable that, that, you know, this is where he needs to be. And then one of the greatest things happened and Joey came back into the band and it was, it was a great day. Literally, just so, instead of just doing it by phone or email or anything, we need to be together in a room. Let's get together, let's hang out, let's talk, let's catch up as friends do. We've always been at the core, four or five brothers who, for the most part, we get along and we understand each other. And then there's days when you don't understand each other. April 29th, 2010, uh, we went out and had coffee and that was it. We, you know, everyone wanted to be band again. Everyone wanted to be Anthrax. And uh, it was really that simple as four friends getting back together and just having a conversation. You can work things out, you know what I mean? You can make your relationship what it once was. I'm so happy it happened because like I said, that record would be nothing without him on it. For me to to have been a part of this thing the second time around was completely, you know, surreal. It was amazing. We're playing fucking Warsaw, Poland. I think it was 128,000 people on this, in this airfield. You could not, you couldn't see the back of the crowd. I I never witnessed. I've never seen anything like it. Like I said, that lit a fire under everybody's ass, and we got our shit together, and we ended up finishing the record. You know, as you know, with Joey Belladonna, and it came out awesome. And we're, you know, I think we're all very proud of that album. It was like we were making our first album again. You know, we were so hungry, and I think hearing Joey's voice on that day, that energy and that drive to write more songs, you know, and that's exactly what happened. Everybody, the anticipation, because Joey was back with Anthrax, what was it going to sound like? Could it sound, was it going to sound as good as the past? Oh my God, we, you know, all the questions were there. 
One of the best things about this record is it helped to repair old relationships. And the praying hands, I think, <laughs> it, it's almost, it almost signifies like, please let this work out. <laughs> I see worship music as another pivot time in Anthrax's career. I can remember, you know, 2010, we were out, we were doing those big four shows in Europe, and then we came back to the States and we did the tour with Slayer and Megadeth in the fall. And that's when we really started digging in to the songs we had written for what was to become worship music. We just came back from all these great big four shows and we were all on this ultimate high of that. And we wanted to bring it over into the recording studio with Joey Belladonna. And um, it all went like that. It's exactly how it went. Everybody was really psyched about what could be again. I, I remember the first song Joey sang like a demo version of was fight them till you can't. That was the that was the first thing he did. The first song he sang was fight them, and I just got all crazy, and I was just like, that is it. That's the sound. Hearing Joey on fight them till you can't was so instantly right and instantly familiar because, you know, obviously there's a touchstone there. Joey made all those records with Anthrax. It's not like it sounded like, well, what's that? Of course, it's Joey with Anthrax, but it's new Anthrax. It's Anthrax that was written, you know, in 2010. And it sounds, oh, wait, it's so it's new, but it's got Joey on it. And it, it all of that turned it into this thing that was so fucking exciting. It's, it's this f familiar voice, but yet it's with this modern sound. Joey came in and sang his ass off on that record. For me, it's the way things are supposed to be now. I, mean, I put a lot, of, a lot of passion into that. I mean, I, I guess that I feel like I had to prove something. I don't know, I just know, I, I just, just do your thing, be yourself. And I'm happy with the cuts. You know, that's the one thing about the band. It's like you start out with something to prove. And I don't think you ever stop trying to prove something, whether it's to yourself or to critics or, or, or to just maybe even the rest of the guys that you, you still have a lot in you. Fight until you can't. That song could have been on Among the Living. Uh, 100%. I think it was absolutely that song and as well as like Earth on Hell on uh, on Worship Music, that song too. Both of those songs are very much to me like, well, that's the band that wrote Among the Living and this is now how they write thrash songs in 2009, 10, you know, when we were writing that stuff. A song like Earth on Hell, a song like Fight Him Till You Can't, a song like I'm Alive, a song like The Giant, um, these were songs that uh, I just knew were, 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 were great. And then once lyrics were put on them, they were even better. Bum, 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 bum. And then the fucking verse riff. To me, that verse riff. Ba -da 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 Holy shit. That's like, that is, that riff is so much fun to play and it's so goddamn heavy. We've talked about it being a, a zombie thing, like it's like fighting zombies, but really my initial inspiration for the lyrics to that song comes from 30 Days of Night. And if you read some of the lyrics in there, it's talking about that idea. <laughs> like, I mean, Steve Niles, the, the whole concept of that, I remember getting that when it came out. I throw the word brilliant around a lot, but it's fucking brilliant. The way I wrote the lyrics, it could be about fighting those vampires. It could be about just a zombie attack. It's about fighting things in your life. We are the devil you know is anthrax. That's what I'm talking about. So I'm telling you, let the right one in. Listen to us. Don't waste your time with bullshit. The lyric, the, the, the hook, let the right one in, you know, if, if 
if you like Swedish vampire movies, <laughs> then then you'll know where I got that from. I always knew after seeing that that movie, Let the Right One In, the Swedish version only, please. I always knew I would use that line somehow uh, in a song, and it just totally worked as the hook. Even though it has nothing to do with the movie or what that movie's about, I just like that phrase, let the right one in. A lot of it is when I'm saying our kind won't be seen again. I'm talking about us and Metallica and Slayer and Iron Maiden and Megadeth and Judas Priest and Exodus and on and on and on and on. Like uh, Pantera and Sepultura. That's that. That's, what i'm talking about the, these bands where where we came from fight until you can't devil you know were two songs that came together quickly in the end was like a year of of coming back to it we kept coming back to it because there was there was like i think one or two of the parts were always there but we never had the chorus we never had the hook it always feels like a tribute initially it was a song called down goes the sun that was that was what we were calling it initially because there's those and there's a, that line that's even in the song when the sun goes down the sun goes down on me there was still something about it it wasn't it wasn't right it wasn't right and i, I felt like the lyrics were not equal to the music the title for the song the demo was called epic because it just had this epic feel and it took it, it, it took you on a journey. I knew I wanted to write in the end about Daryl and Ronnie because both of them had passed in the time since we've come for you all. We hadn't made a record and lost both of them. The music to that song, it was speaking to me so strongly that that's what the song has got to be about. It's talking to me, it's telling me the song is about Daryl, the song is about Ronnie. You know, he went through a lot of phases with Black Sabbath himself and and I, you know, I went through my thing and I was with him when I was out of the band and we talked about it. But yes, Ronnie was, I mean, he was just too awesome. We hung out a lot. We became super good friends more than anything, you know, and uh, I loved the way he played. And yeah, Ronnie's fantastic. We were going to write it about Daryl and Ronnie Dio about the Lone Star being dark tonight because that's where they're from, Daryl and Vinny. A diamond shines so bright, diamond. Daryl. In the end, that song, to me, is still one of my favorite Anthrax songs. I think it's a great representation of of who we are now. I really love playing that every night. There's, there's so many good songs in that record that I, I would love to play live all the time, but this is a huge catalog for Anthrax at this point. I felt like, you know, I, I really need to step up here because, you know, this is subject matter that it it deserves, obviously, the better than I've ever done. and. Uh, it was a lot of, uh, man, a lot of sweating over those those words because I want to do my friends justice, obviously. They, you know, two people who I was close to who mean so much to everybody. And I, I just wanted to do the best I could with my words to really give them the tribute they deserve because I felt like the music was already there. And uh, once it all came together, yeah, for me, it, it's the highlight of the record. To this day, that song, when I hear it, when I'm playing it, it does something to me. I get caught up in it. It's like almost like I'm possessed by it. And uh, it's one of my favorite songs on the record because it makes me think about those days and it makes me think about a person who's no longer here, but he actually is here. It's unlike anything we've ever written before. I don't think we ever had a song like it before in the history of the band. And it, Live, it's become, you know, a real focal point, uh, a centerpiece of the show, and uh, yeah, it's um, it was worth sticking with it for a year. The cover, which is another Alatross piece, represents these horrific creatures, which could have been the people that were pulling us up. And then music is there's no music in this place where they're in because the original cover for for worship music. The pentathrax thing that we created that's on the center of it, that they're all kind of, the horde is like moving towards. That originally was an old school, like Victrola that you have to crank. And the original idea is like they were, the sound was coming out of it and it was bringing them there. 
it's got a first, second, and third act on the record. It is a very cinematic album, uh, listening through it from start to finish. Yeah, I like that comparison. It's it's the album version of Apocalypse Now. I, I, I will definitely agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I think they had spent a lot of time on that music, at least, um, before I was even involved. So by the time it came to me, I would say three quarters recorded, at least musically, and then you know, needed all the vocals. And I, I will say that Jay Rustin, too, is a big part of that record. You know, he was a, a big piece of the puzzle as well. At first, it was just doing the vocals. We didn't even really talk about the mix. And so I started doing vocals with Joey, and it, we had a really good relationship, and it worked great. It really worked probably the best with Joey I felt than any other producer. We just hit it off, so we started knocking songs out fairly quickly, and the band was really stoked with what we were doing. I think we beat, we used to beat things down too much, and I'm like, man, you're really chasing me down nowhere here. And regardless, each song doesn't always give me the best results. I mean, some are really, they're nail, nail biters to, to really make something out of it. And you know, we hand the song in the night before, or night after I do it, you know, they're small suggestions, which is nice too. We're not like, we submit some and they're like, oh my God, geez, what the hell did you guys do? You know, what, what's wrong? What, they have trust, which the trust is really, really a, a good thing too. It was a total collaboration and, and every record really is. You know, I end up being co-producer a lot on stuff because the band produces or somebody in the band is producing and Rob had been handling a lot of the recording duties and, you know, helping them get guitar sounds and engineering and whatnot. So yeah, obviously talking to him extensively and, and the band, you know, just getting everybody's thoughts and feelings about stuff and what they, how they want their instruments to sound, how they want the vocals to sound. You know, Jay, he's just really, he really just captures us. He knows how to make Anthrax sound like Anthrax. He He's able to take the sound that I hear in my head what I imagined the band to sound like. Listening to that record, I think we did that, I'm proud to say, because I love those songs. I love the way Joey sang on it. I love what we wrote. Uh, I'm, uh, to this day, I can still put that record on, be proud of every song. You know, another chapter opens again, and with some um, with some characters from from before. <laughs> That's um, some, some uh, characters that you knew. Joey Belladonna comes back into the fold, and. Uh, kicks ass and um and then a whole lot of touring came in after that and so now we're into 2011 and we're starting to ramp up towards an album release and then we get the call <laughs> uh metallica is talking about doing yankee stadium in september <laughs> they want to know if you're available yankee stadium not known for shows and i think i even looked it up when we found out it was for sure, September 14th, 2011, the Big Four is playing Yankee Stadium. I looked it up and the last two shows for years before that were Paul McCartney and the Pope. I mean, that's special. We are talking metal band, right? I mean, you almost go, is this, are they kidding? So that date right there, September 14th, 2011, yeah, that was the big day. That's it. That's the biggest thing. The biggest thing that could ever happen as far as playing a show. There's there's nothing bigger. And people are excited about the band again. We had we were still with Nuclear Blast. We had since we turned to Megaforce for the States. Everything was full steam ahead. That was the album that really showed Anthrax were back. Anthrax were bigger and better than ever before. The album debuted at number 12 on the Billboard Top 200. Um, that was the second highest charting record of their career. And in 2011, Anthrax were celebrating their 30th anniversary. So it was no small feat. And that was quite a statement, really showing the power of the band at that moment in time. And then when Joey comes back, it's like, oh, there they are. Worship music is one of my all-time favorite Anthrax albums. Joey still got his voice. I mean, Joey's a badass. He's one of my favorite singers ever. And I watched Joey sing, and that is a guy who's born to do it. You know, and his voice sounds so good. It sounds like he's just kept what's great about his voice, his crazy range and everything. To me, it's right. 
Joey should be an anthrax. It's the way it is. It's, I don't ever second guess that. And Joey's a good guy and he deserves a great career. And that band feels correct uh, with that, with him in place. Obviously everything worked out the way it was supposed to, you know, with Joey coming back to the band. It's a hundred percent the way things were supposed to work out. People really took to that record. It made tons of journalists top albums of 2011 lists. They were on Jimmy Fallon. Uh, the Devil You Know really had a great run at Active Rock Radio at that point. Um, the tour cycle lasted until September of 2013, so it was a two year long touring cycle. You can always tell the success of a record because the amount of touring you do. Because when a record doesn't do that well or is not accepted well, you don't do that much touring. But um, when it's accepted well, they want to keep seeing these songs perform live. So that's what you do, you stay on tour forever. So after Worship came out, it was just, it was on, man. By September 2012, the album had surpassed sales of 100,000 units in the US. Anthrax were back, Anthrax were bigger, badder than ever. When the reviews came in for the record, that's what everybody said. It sounds like Anthrax, but fresh. And what's better than that, really? Man, and there, there's, there's a lot of truth into uh, reinventing yourself. You have chapter one, you have chapter two, you have chapter three. And this is the way that we are going to ride this out to, uh, to we say that's time to go. So, worship music, that was the record that pretty much, yeah, it, 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 it repaired relationships. This is my blood. They, they are my family. I saw Frankie the other day. Frankie came out to dinner. And someone was asking, like, how long have you guys doesn't know the histories? Like, how long have you guys known each other? And we, we looked at each other like 1983. And the guy was like, and you still talk to each other? That's in, that's insane. You've been in a band all, and you still talk to each other. And Frankie, and we just both of us started laughing. It's like we're brothers. We're, it's not even band members. Like. It's, it's family. It truly is. I know Frankie's mentioned that a lot, but it, it truly is. It truly becomes family. And sometimes families fight and that's what happens, but it's still family and you move forward and you know what? X amount of time later, you pick up a phone or you go to someone's house or whatever it is and you move forward. I think people don't understand that, that when someone gets fired from a band or someone leaves a band, and that's it. And I guess maybe because history has shown us sometimes, yeah, it isn't amicable. And that's it. It's a split and people don't talk anymore and they hate each other and they talk a whole bunch of shit. But I can say with the guys who are in Anthrax, you know, me and Joey, Charlie, Frankie, John Bush, like all these dudes, Danny Looker, Spitz, all these people you've seen in all this, these weeks and weeks of these documentary series. There's no bad blood, man. There's there's no bad blood at all. Rob, Paul Crook, you know, uh, if I missed anyone, I'm sorry, but there's, it's just, it's all family. It's just all become a part of this Anthrax family. I mean, we have so many different things going on that makes it special, you know? And uh, I love that because I wouldn't want to sound like anybody, look like anybody, or be like any other band, you know? That's one of the most magical things to really take away from this band and this whole, uh, should I say, duration of what we've been doing, it really is special. And I love that. And I want it to stay that way, you know?